Hi there, it's Jason from Codemanship uh, with another video diary entry. Sorry, it's been a while since the last one, been rather busy. Um, okay, so I'm revisiting this topic of the testing pyramid. You may have heard of this. Um, it's a really, really super important but much misunderstood concept in, in software development. And it's really all about the makeup of our test suites, what kind of tests we're relying on. So the idea behind the uh, testing pyramid, if we visualize our test suites, all the different kinds of tests that we use to ensure that our, our product is working and ready to be shipped, um, if we visualize those tests um, against their execution time, so the higher they, the longer they take to run, the higher up we go in this sort of organization of tests, we would hope to achieve some kind of pyramid where the base of the pyramid, the bulk of our tests, um, is made up of um, essentially fast running tests. Now I'm using the word unit tests here to mean fast running tests that only have one reason to fail. So these are tests where everything happens in the same memory address space. Everything's running in the same process. We're not communicating with web services or we're reading from files or talking to database systems or anything like that. It's all happening in memory. So our tests run in the order of a few milliseconds each. So they're very fast. And we would hope that the bulk of our tests run fast so that our overall test suite is fast enough um, to give us those, those quick feedback loops, those quick test feedback cycles that we need that are in fact essential to achieving continuous delivery, to, to making sure that our code is always shippable. Um, and then uh, an order of magnitude fewer of these tests, we might have a bunch of integration tests that actually wire components of the system. So again, I'm going to qualify this as, when I say integration test, I mean tests that involve um, other processes, other programs, file systems, database management systems, infrastructure, that kind of stuff, web services, you know, the sort of thing. So I'm not talking about testing multiple classes at the same time that talk to each other. I still view those as unit tests um, because they're testing one thing, hopefully, um, in terms of behavior, um, but we'll get into that. Um, so your base of your pyramid is unit tests. You might have thousands or tens of thousands of those. And then the middle of your pyramid, an order of magnitude fewer tests will be integration tests, tests that actually talk to uh, web services and um, databases and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, the tip of your pyramid, the fewest number of tests, would be end-to-end -end system tests. For example, testing your application through a web browser, if it's a web application, um, and you wanna have maybe just a few dozen of those, a cherry picking of your system tests. Now, the idea is that our unit tests should be testing the logic, the internal logic of our application. So I'm gonna be using a little example in a minute of some internal logic that we can test in different ways. We could test it through a browser or we could test it using unit tests. So we're gonna compare and contrast those tests. Um, so end-to-end -end tests, typically the purpose of end-to-end -end tests is they're like smoke tests, basically. They're tests of configuration. Um, does the unit test test all of the logic? The integration test test all of the contracts, the different pieces of the system talking to each other. Um, and then finally, what's left to test? Well, does it actually work on this machine? So we build it and deploy it into a particular target environment, and we run a few tests, a cherry picking of tests that are specifically designed to hit every piece of the system. So every component in the system, we wanna see talk to each other to make sure that it all works in this environment. They're not there to test the logic of our application. If the logic of a system test is failing, um, but none of our unit or integration tests are failing, then we've missed an internal test, basically. So that's kind of the theory, and it's a theory that it is, it's more than theory, it's very, very important that you try to strive for this. But I see way too many teams and way too many organizations um, actively either building an upside down pyramid. So the majority of their tests are actually system level tests, for example, testing through a browser or calling web services over the web. Um, um, or they're building what we call a test diamond, where the, the middle, basically, the, the majority of the tests are actually integration tests. So they're not necessarily testing through the web browser or through the, the app UI or something like that, um, but they are testing code that has direct external dependencies. It reads data from databases or it calls web services. And so you end up with a, with a sort of a middle layer in your, your test pyramid. Um, that bulges out, so more like a test diamond, really. Uh, test diamonds and, in particular, upside-down testing pyramids are very, very unhealthy. What they tend to lead to is, is slow build and test cycles, 
and as I've established in previous videos, that slows all delivery cycles, all the feedback cycles depend on that. It's that effect that I talked about in a previous video called short delay, long queue. So maybe your builds take only five minutes longer, but you'd be surprised how much that delay starts to back up all of the work that you're doing and you end up with lead times on features, for example, that go from say days into weeks into months and maybe even into years and in some cases into never because they never happen. So it's very, very important that you get your, you engineer your tests so that, that their pyramid is the right way up. But the tip of the pyramid, the slowest running tests are the fewest that you, you need. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's imagine we, we will use Guitar Shack because I always use Guitar Shack these days. Um, and we, we've got a, a website for Guitar Shack. As you'll see, it's been super, super beautifully designed. And we've got a website for Guitar Shack where we can essentially add products to a shopping basket. And what we want to know is, um, is the logic of the shopping basket correct? In particular, is the uh, the total the total of the items in the basket calculated correctly? And also, we want to know when we add multiple ver of the same product, does that increase the quantity of that particular product in the basket? So there's a few questions we need to ask. So we've got um, four or so um, tests that we need to do. Now, um, let's go take a look at the code. So this is a, an ASP.NET core web application. So there's just a few little web pages here. Uh, and probably the easiest thing to do to demonstrate would be to run it. So I'm going to run the web server locally. It'll take a little while there. And eventually a browser should pop up taking us to the home page of uh, Guitar Shack. As you can see, I'm an amazingly skilled web designer. How beautiful this is. It's got no graphics, so at least it's fast. Okay, so the idea is that we can we can go take a look at what products are available. Let's select a product like the Epiphone Les Paul Classic, um, a good budget guitar, and we can see the price and how many we've got in stock. Um, and then, of course, if this was a real guitar shop, there would be photographs and reviews and stuff as well. And then we can add it to the basket like so, and you'll see the item ends up in the basket. Let's just take a look at our basket. So we can see there we've got one item in the basket with a quantity of one, our Epiphone Les Paul Classic, and there's the total price of the um, the items in the basket and what we want to know is is that price being calculated correctly for various test cases various contents of baskets and also this quantity here if i go back to our les paul classic and add another one you'll see that the the, the basket um, items doesn't go up but the quantity changes so now we have a quantity of two and double the total, basically. So that's what we're looking to test. Now, we've got multiple choices here. And what I see a lot of teams doing, actively doing, is saying, we're gonna test the functionality of this through the browser. So we'll test adding things to the basket, and we'll test that the total is calculated correctly. And we're gonna do that um, through the web browser. Now, I'm currently testing this manually. And manually is the most upside down, upside down test pyramid of them all. Um, it's really, really slow. So if I wanted to go through my four test cases manually, it would take me maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds to do that. Remember also that this website is running locally, so everything's happening on this machine that, that you're watching now, so there's no real network overhead either. So it would be considerably slower if we actually deployed it somewhere. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, first of all, test this using front-end um, because manual test is too slow, so let's speed that up from 20, 30 seconds to go through those test cases, maybe longer, um, to let's see if we can get that down. Okay, so I'm using Selenium Web Driver, so I'm gonna be using their Chrome driver, which can drive a web browser, you know, click on links, click buttons, and, and query elements within the page, so we can extract information from the page. And as you can see, this, this, this test code has already been um, fairly abstracted already, so there's not a lot of web buttony clicks kind of stuff going on in here. I've extracted all that into a shared helper class here called my basket driver. And that essentially um, allows me to add things to the basket to check out, to get the total of items and the, get the quantity and so on in the basket. Um, so that we can, we can write our tests without constantly repeating all this web element stuff, basically all this web driver specific stuff. So they're already fairly abstracted and fairly refactored in the tests. This is my basic test. There are four tests here, basically. Um, first of all, we test that the, the total of an empty basket is zero. So we essentially, as soon as we get to the home, home page, we go immediately to the checkout and see what the basket total is, and it should be zero. Um, then we add one item to the basket, and we just check that the total, total of one item is correct. 
Then we do two items in the basket and make sure that they're, and so you can see here, essentially we're adding an Epiphone guitar and a Fender guitar. It's using basically matching on partial descriptions of the product names um, as we drive it. Um, and then I add two of the same product um, there and just check that we get a quantity for that particular item of two. Um, and also checking um, that the, uh, the total of those are correct. Um, so we've got four basic test cases really. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin up the Chrome driver. So that's gonna open a Chrome browser. It's gonna perform these actions and um, we'll make these assertions. And at the end, we're gonna quit the driver basically. So it should, if it's worked, close the browser. Now, if I run this, you'll notice that, the, that it creates four separate Chrome driver sessions. So it opens the browser four times once for each of the tests. And the reason I've done that, we'll discuss in a minute, is even though that's much slower, and we'll look at a different version of that um, later, even though that makes the test run a lot slower, it does mean the tests are isolated because it's a fresh web session each time. It's, a, it's an empty basket every time. So we're always going resetting and going back to the beginning. So let's run these tests and you'll see as we go um, that the browser will hopefully open. Uh, our website should be running. Let's see. So it's opening a browser, off we go. First one is obviously a little slow. Uh -huh -huh. Bing bong bang, there's the first one. Bing bong bang. So it's compared to testing manually, it's obviously very fast. Um, and one more test. Okay, so it's in the order of 18 seconds. It's usually a little quicker than that, usually around 10 seconds. And 10 seconds is a big improvement on how long it would take me to do it manually. So, so for sure, um, automating front-end tests is a step forward from manual testing. And this is often the mistake people make. They think, well, if we invest money in um, automating our manual tests, at least that's gonna speed things up. But it's a kind of a local optimum um, because what you're doing is you're writing tests that you don't really wanna live with um, for very long. What you really wanna be doing is writing unit tests, which is why I think Michael Feather's book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, places much emphasis not on automating front-end system tests to protect you as you change leg legacy code, but actually refactoring the code to make it unit testable so you can write those fast running unit tests so that you're moving towards a test pyramid that is the right way up. The problem with automating everything at the front end, which seems tempting at first because it does buy you higher coverage faster, so maybe, maybe some smoke tests would not be a bad idea. And that's often what we'll do when we're working on le legacy systems, just rig up a few smoke tests. But if you sort of dedicate yourself to writing lots and lots, thousands basically of front-end tests, particularly if you're testing, using them to test the internal logic of the system. In other words, we're testing basket totals and quantities. Um, and everything that we're having to go through, we're having to go through the web browser, we've got to go through the web pages, we've got to find the right buttons or the right links, we've got to click them, etc., in order to perform what are essentially logical actions that you can see a kind of at an abstract level described in the test. So I've abstracted these actions out. We add to the basket, we check out, and we get the total from the basket and so on. So it's all abstracted away. So these kind of read like they might actually be unit tests. But if we look behind the, behind the curtain, as it were, to see the wizard, in actual fact, we are driving a website. So there's, there's extra complexity here. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a step forward from manual testing, but it's arguably a step forward in the wrong direction if you keep going in this direction. Um, now, of course, people who are familiar with browser-based testing will say, well, why, why not maybe share the browser session between tests um, and then it'll run a lot faster. And indeed I've done that. So I've done a sort of a journey test. So it's the same web session and we're just walking it through a journey of different actions and making assertions as we go. Um, you'll see I'm using um, um, the fixed method order um, attribute of JUnit, the JUnit test runner here, um, to say that it should execute the methods in a particular order. So you can already begin to see a weakness with this particular approach, which is that you have to run all of the tests and you have to run them in a specific order, otherwise it's not going to work because each test, apart from the first one, is relying on the system being left in a particular state. Or in other words, it's relying on the basket containing certain items for this next test. But when we run it, you'll see there is a payoff so we do get a little something from this. Because there's only one web driver session, we open the browser once, off it goes. 
And you can see that that's considerably faster. That's a considerable saving there um, in time. But it's still for four tests in the order of roughly a second per test. Um, and so it's still at the top of our pyramid, maybe a little further down than the, the, um, the, um, the isolated test I show you, but, but we're still kind of near the top of the pyramid here. And again, my point is, if we're relying on these tests, tests like these, to tell us whether or not the total of the shopping basket is calculated correctly, we've taken a wrong term. What we really need is unit tests, unit tests. Um, so like I said, this runs faster, but we've paid a price. And the price we've paid is our tests are gonna be a lot flakier now. And I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Um, this third test is relying on there already being one item in the basket left there by the previous test. Let's see if we run this test on its own in a new web session. So it's an empty basket. Yeah, and our test fails basically because yeah, there was only one. There were no items in the basket to begin with. So so we end up creating test suites that are very flaky. They run slow, and they are brittle. And that's generally true of front-end tests. User interfaces, have, in particular, have a tendency to change, and they change often. And that means there are mappings to that user interface, clicking buttons and specific links, and so on and so forth, um, can make the tests very brittle. That, that code can be changing a lot. Um, it is a good habit to get into to abstract away the code that actually interacts with the UI and hide it behind some kind of business-oriented um, facade, if you like, for, that drives the web. So you see in our facade here, we've got things like add and get total and check out and so on and so forth, so that it reads more like a real basket, um, like they're interacting with a real basket. But even with all of those niceties, that's just generally good practice if you're, if you're um, automating UI tests and front-end tests. But um, even at, at that, this kind of level um, of front-end testing, if we carried on down this vein, if we did all of our tests this way, or tested all the logic of Guitar Shack this way, and ended up with maybe hundreds or even thousands of these tests, um, they're going to take hundreds or thousands of seconds to run. Thousands of seconds is in the order of hours, potentially. Um, and that's going to create a, a massive bottlenecks in our delivery cycles um, by slowing down the build and test cycle. So we don't really want to go down this route. So I'm just going to end this little um, discussion. It, it is a discussion. I'm sure you're shouting back at the TV now um, by just taking a look at a different version of these tests. So this is an ASP.NET Core website, but the actual core logic of it is not contained in the web part although that can be unit tested as well. It's contained just in a plain library uh, project here. So we do actually have a basket class that could be tested independently. It has no direct external dependencies. We could write fast running unit tests for this. And that's exactly what I've done. So a little test project here. And we've got roughly the, the same four tests there. First thing you'll notice is there's a lot less test code. Now they do of course look a little bit like um, they look a little bit like the uh, the original test code, but there's none of the helper code. There's no button clicks going on or anything like that. We're just interacting directly with these classes. Um, test case is the same, but you'll notice that there's no mention of Epiphone or Fender or anything like that. And that's because it doesn't matter. What matters is each product has a unique ID um, and it has a price. And we, that's all we really need to know about the product. We don't need its description. It's not relevant. So one of the, the things that, that helps us simplify our tests with, with unit tests, these internal tests, is we can emit stuff that's not relevant. We can't really do that at the system level. Uh, the data has to be there for it to work. Um, we have to be able to identify a product in order to click on the link, for example. Um, so um, you can emit um, a lot of information that's not really relevant to the problem. All that's relevant is the product ID, the price and the quantity, and the, the contents of the basket. So it's the same tests, an empty basket, a single item, two items, uh, and a single item with a quantity of two, so we add it to the basket twice, basically. Um, and we're asking exactly the same questions. It's the same logic. This is the, this is the code that's being run when we're interacting with the website. But let's just run these tests and see I probably need to stop running the web server. Okay. So we were in the order of maybe three seconds to run those, those, those four system tests, which is not bad. And it's having a little think, are you actually running the tests? Did you run the, did you run the tests and I didn't see? 
<laughs> I just didn't notice. So 38 milliseconds, basically. So we've gone from, you know, the order of three to 10 seconds, or 20 seconds or even longer, um, to um, 38 milliseconds, which is orders of magnitude faster. It's orders of magnitude, it's hundreds of times faster. Um, and that's why it's really important to test the logic of your applications using these fast running internal tests, these unit tests, as some people call them, um, that don't have external dependencies. And we're not going through the UI or calling a web service so that we can test the vast majority of our code very, very quickly. OK, so that's just the practicals of the, of the test pyramid, basically. And whenever you, you see tests at the front end that are asking questions like, what's the total of the basket and so on and so forth, ask yourself, should that actually be a unit test? Maybe there is something architecturally that's getting in your way, but you need to fix that. You need to refactor the code to make that part of it unit testable so that when you change it, it's safe to do so. And gradually your, your unit test coverage will build up and you'll end up with a test pyramid that is the right way up, which means faster build and test cycles, which means faster feedback cycles generally, which means shorter lead times, which means greater agility, which is good news for businesses with competitors basically. So anyway, there you go. That's the test pyramid made flesh, as it were, with a simple example. I hope you're well. Hope you're staying safe. Until the next time. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention, if you're enjoying these videos, please uh, like and subscribe and click the uh, bell for notifications.